Jennifer Jones has started supporting independent tech news directly. If you would like to be like Jennifer, become a DTNS member today at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 9th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline's grandma's house, I'm Sarah Lane. And from disappointingly cool uh, Finnish countryside for summer, I'm Patrick Beja. And uh, from the outskirts of uh, Universal Studios, I'm Roger Chang, the producer. Yeah, we're not disappointingly cool out here. We're not cool at all. <laughs> no, we're just cool. Oh, we're not cool. Well, we're cool. So many meetings, so many We're layers. just disappointing. <laughs> Uh, well, folks, uh, we have got a great show for you today. Patrick Beja is going to uh, run down the trends in streaming video games and then subscriptions and and basically the, the big trends in games now that we've had a little time for the, all the E3 stuff to settle out. Uh, we've got that Uber comfort level. Is that a good thing? I don't know. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The Mini Cooper SE is getting a battery electric version called the BEV Mini. Production will begin at Mini's Cowley plant in the UK in November. The company estimates ranges between 148 to 167 miles. That's about 235 to 270 kilometers based on Europe's WLTP and NEDC testing protocols. Mm, well, that is disappointing. Only 270 kilometers max. Yeah. IBM announced its acquisition of Red Hat is complete at $34 billion. It is IBM's largest deal ever. Red Hat will become a unit of IBM's hybrid cloud division. Red Hat CEO Jim Whitehurst uh, will report to CEO Ginny Rometty. Security researcher Jonathan Lightshu posted about a vulnerability in the Zoom video conferencing software and also the white-labeled Ring Central version of the same software for Mac OS that could allow a malicious website to turn on your camera without permission. Even if Zoom is uninstalled, a local host web server may remain behind and reinstall Zoom without user interaction. Lightshu has a patch for the vulnerability and some instructions for disabling video by default as a mitigation factor, as well as how to shut down and remove that local host server. Lightshu notified Zoom of the issue on March 26th, and Zoom issued a partial quick fix on June 24th. Warner Media announced its new streaming service scheduled to arrive in spring of 2020 will be called HBO Max. Along with HBO content, the service will also exclusively have all 236 episodes of Friends, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and Pretty Little Liars. It'll also have previous seasons of Warner-produced shows for the CW, like Batwoman, starting 30 days before the premiere of the next season. It'll also have other content from Turner Networks, Crunchyroll, Rooster Teeth DC, and Looney Tunes. All right, Patrick, let's talk a little more about some some peace talks, some some peace implementations, really. Peace in our time between Amazon and YouTube. Amazon announced that the YouTube app is available on Fire TV devices, including the Fire TV Stick and Fire TV Cube, as well as Toshiba Insignia. Uh, Insignia, Element, and Westinghouse smart TVs, though not the Echo Show. YouTube Kids and YouTube TV apps will also be released later this year. It's a full-fledged app with voice controls. Uh, the Prime Video app on iOS and Android now works with Chromecast devices, and the Prime Video app for Android TV is getting a wider rollout as well. So, uh, Prime Video showing up on more Android TV, uh, with some exceptions, YouTube coming back to the Fire TV. Everybody's happy. It is nice to see this happening and 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 to see more cross-platform uh, cooperation. That's one of the worries of having just a few competitors here is they might fight tooth and nail to keep each other off their platform. So this this is good. It's a good story. It, what what's the deal? What did they make a deal? Of course, we might never know. There was a deal. There what was, was deal. that deal? Mm -hmm. I mean, it could Did be as simple as, okay, we'll put Prime Video on these platforms if you put YouTube on these platforms. I mean, seriously. Maybe the Mexican standoff lasted long enough and they were yeah. like, all right, just whatever. But I all wonder if someone who originally someone. disputed it uh, left the company and all the new people were mm. like, why are we fighting again? I don't know. <laughs> I'm new. I, I'm, I don't have an Echo Show. Tom, I know you do. Patrick, Roger, you may as well. Is this something that you're like, ah, you know, the YouTube... A TV app would be great if I, if I, you know, if, if no, or the, no, I mean, no. it was, it's, it was nice when it was there because yeah. there were more videos from YouTube that showed up. Uh, that's like, Hey, here's, here's a new cool thing, but I, I don't miss it. 
Let's talk about the future of transportation, or at least what Uber wants you to think it is. Uber announced a new tier of service for riders called Uber Comfort. The tier requires drivers to use a car from among recent makes and certain models with a minimum amount of legroom. Drivers also have to maintain a 4.85 or higher rating. Riders who choose the levels not only get the nicer cars and higher rated drivers, but some pre-ride preferences as well that they can set in the app, something that Uber Black and SUV riders have had since May. So Uber's ruling it out to more folks. Conversation preference includes happy to chat or no preference or quiet, please, meaning I don't want to talk to the driver. Or temperature preferences can also be said to warmer or colder, depending on what the rider wants. Fares will be 20 to 40 percent higher than Uber X. The new option is available in multiple U.S. cities and in Ottawa, Canada. So these are features that were already existed in one case for Uber Black and SUV in the other case for uh, the, the things about getting the better drivers and the better cars with more legroom that was available to Uber Diamond level, like loyalty mm -hmm. level people. So they're just saying, oh, let's take all of those things that already existed and package them as a level we could charge more for and see if people will pay for it. So this is essentially Uber trying to increase their the hit and run. margins, I suppose. Um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 sort of offering features where, you know, where I'm like, I don't know, I'm a small person. I'm like, more legroom, I don't care. Put me in a smart car. I just want to get from point A to point B type <laughs> thing. But that does matter to some people. Or let's say you're maybe going to be on a conference call and you actually don't want the driver to be talking to you, not because you're trying to be rude, but because that's just the way it goes. Or temperature control is something that's really important to you. Uber is like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll put these features into something that we can charge you a little bit more for. And then you feel like you're in control of your own experience. Well, so and how also, far can they, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say it also, I mean, you could do the same thing with your mouth. You can get into the car and say like, <laughs> Hey, I have to be on a call. Do you mind if I, you know, if I not don't talk yeah. or oh, could you turn down the, the air conditioning? It's a little cool in here. I, I have plenty of yeah. drivers who ask me how the temperature is. This is a way for people who are like, I don't want, I want to avoid the awkwardness of asking. I just want to sure. yeah. you know, make it efficient, have it known from the beginning what I want. Well, it, 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 there's this whole, it's, it's like this frictionless thing that's being pushed onto us in so many forms. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like and getting a, getting a car for Uber or Uber Eats or, you know, a variety of other things are, you know, sometimes I'm like, okay, that makes sense. That's cool. That's convenient. At least the option is up to me. And other times I'm like, I feel like they're inventing situations that don't actually exist all that often to, to, in order to, for, to upsell me. I just had a thought. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of hijacking a little bit of the email uh, in, in a small way. I was thinking, what else could Uber charge you extra for in these situations? What if you could eat? They combine Uber Eats with the ride. You can order the food with the ride. It arrives. You get in. You eat while getting to the place you want to be at. And then you pay and they charge you extra. And uh, if you want to talk with your mouthful or not, there's a selection for that. There's an option for that as well. Yes, of <laughs> <Yeah>. course. <laughs> uh, would you like a Would you like a little little dolly table that you can sit over your lap while you eat? Or you that, just that would work. And the, a little TV tray with yeah. an, uh, an iPad on the back seat mm -hmm. on the on the mm -hmm. seat in front of you. I like this. Uh, mm -hmm. Uber Patrick is available for consulting. Just email. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be called Uber. Food ha, ha, ha. and ride, <laughs> <laughs> because it'll it only serve French food. <laughs> only French food, right? Uh, Apple refreshed some MacBook Pro and MacBook Air laptops. The entry level MacBook Pro adds a Touch Bar and Touch ID, along with a 1.4 gigahertz quad core, eighth gen core Intel i5 Coffee Lake chip with a turbo frequency of 3.9 gigahertz, but still only offers two USB-C ports. So uh, it's no longer without a touch bar, but it still only has two USB-C ports. A 128 gigabyte SSD model goes for 1299 and 256 gigabyte model for 1499. The MacBook Air got updated with true display and a $100 price drop. The Air now starts at $1,099 or $999 for students. Both laptops also come with the updated third-generation butterfly keyboard while it still exists. Apple discontinued the 12-inch MacBook, though, and the non-Retina MacBook Air models. Those are just not available. Man, I, you know, anybody who has a non-Retina MacBook will probably be like, you know, it's fine. But 
having had retina for as long as I have with several machines that I use regularly, going back to the non-retina is like, I might as well be looking at something underwater. How uh, do you so, live so I, with yourself is essentially your reaction. Kind well, how did I live? Yeah, how did I live with myself all of that time? Like we just we just weren't looking at something that was nice and crisp and clear. So it doesn't it doesn't surprise me that that that's being phased out. I don't know. I I I I'm kind of in the market for a new MacBook Pro. Uh, the Touch Bar is something that people have lamented. Uh, I I actually use it pretty often, and maybe I I've forced myself to use it because it's there more than. It being I will really helpful my money's to me, worth out of yeah, this exactly. Computer. But it, but it, but it is something that it, I certainly don't. I don't dislike it. It's an option that I can use or not. But, but yeah, yeah. The MacBook Air coming down in price a little bit uh, for folks in the market for for something you know light and easy. I think the only you know the real thing that I've seen people complain about is that um, the the new entry level MacBook Pro just has those two USB C ports rather than four. Um, I have four on my MacBook Pro that I'm using right now, that, and this guy's on its last legs, and I use all of them constantly. <laughs> like two would be untenable. Yeah, I'd say um, if you're if you want to get a new MacBook Pro, wait a few months, wait until the end of the year to see if those new keyboards are going yeah. to uh, show up. Uh, that's the the rumor from last week, I believe, and that might be a significant uh, game changer for the device. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Let's move on to music streaming, shall we? The Spotify Lite app came out in beta last year and is now being released officially in 36 markets on the Google Play Store in Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and Africa. The 10 megabyte app can run on any device using Android version 4.3 or higher. It can also handle unreliable or weak connections. The app is available for free and premium Spotify account holders. It supports search and saving for songs, artists, and playlists. And it also lets users set a data limit for the app. However, there aren't plans to bring the light app to iOS, at least at this time. So this is uh, significant in that Spotify is becoming one of the many companies who is making a light app because they want to increase their market share in areas of the world that are increasingly using uh, smartphones, but have uh, data limits or unreliable connections, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and these light apps are important for, for getting uptake there. Uh, it's not on iOS because the people who have those concerns generally don't buy iPhones. They, they buy less expensive phones. I wonder if there uh, it has less functionality. I suppose. I wonder it if there's a reason to not. Ninety the functionality it. of the main Spotify app. Right. Uh, most of the limited functionality is around video, which isn't essential to the experience anyway. I wonder if people wouldn't prefer to have the light app instead of the regular one just because why not yeah because if it's using less data if it's probably better on your battery life maybe a little bit too mm -hmm. yeah for yeah. sure uh, but it's certainly most important for the people who are like yeah i don't have a lot of storage on this phone because it's the phone i could afford and i don't have a lot of data because it's the data plan i could afford but i still want to listen to my music mm -hmm. yeah good on them uh, let's move on to gaming. An update to Google's Stadia FAQ on July 3rd clarified that once purchased, games will be available on Stadia even if the publisher removes it from the service. So they will always be available as long as Stadia is in operation, I suppose. A Stadia account can also support up to four controllers uh, for local multiplayer games, and the Stadia controller can be set up by Bluetooth Low Energy and then use Wi-Fi for gameplay, or it can be plugged in by USB for both. You, Google also clarified that beyond the Pixel 3 and 3a, all Chrome OS tablets will support Stadia at launch. Also, redemption codes will be sent to purchasers of a Founders Pack, a Founders subscription, which can be used on any Google account. So you're not limited to the one you purchased it on. Yeah, that's kind of nifty, the Chrome OS thing. Uh, I hadn't even thought about trying this out, to be honest. But then I realized, well, wait a minute, I have a Pixel Book. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I will try this out. Who knows? Well, do you did you get the um founder spec no so you won't be able to try it well, out um, not not early i'll have to wait till the hoi polloi goes in and buys the subscriptions until it's not like never it's not like if you don't buy the well, founder pack you can never play it 
No, the, the point I was going to make is that this is really a kind of beta that isn't called a beta because sure. once oh, it's available for everyone, uh, you will be able to use it on everything, uh, supposedly. not okay. You won't even need a Chrome OS tablet. In that um, respect, uh, I will need you to send me your redemption code since they can be used on any <laughs> computer. <laughs> yes, I will definitely, absolutely yeah, do that. Yeah, be a pal. Uh, no, that's a, really, that's a good point. Uh, I I do think that but redemption see, that's codes confusing. Like, you want to, you want to, there'll be trafficking in these redemption codes, I bet. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing some people will, uh, but I guess the people who ended up buying and keeping the Founders Pack are going to want to try it. So mm -hmm. once you've redempted it, uh, <laughs> you, 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 it's on your account. Um, but this is this is what's confusing about this whole service. Uh, again, they're not calling it a beta, but the thing that launches in what is it, uh, October or November, um, is so restricted that it it certainly looks like a beta. It quacks like it quacks like a beta. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the the wider release is next year. So. Well, folks, uh, we have more to say about streaming services, including Stadia. Uh, but if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, to keep things efficient be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. So Patrick had an excellent article up on his Medium uh, about three events that symbolize gaming trends and kind of breaking it down for us what those trends are. Patrick, take it away. Sure. So what I tried to do in this article, and I'm going to try to summarize here, is look at the trends that we've all heard about and kind of look forward to what's going to be happening in the next quote unquote generation of consoles. Uh, maybe not at the beginning, which is going to start next year, but down the line a few years, uh, uh, in a few years, maybe 2023, 24, 25. And those uh, three events slash trends are, of course, uh, game subscriptions. We've talked about those a lot. Uh, streaming services. We've talked about those a lot. And in a somewhat cheeky manner, I'm saying controllers uh, getting to every device, which is very important, but it leads to something else. So for subscriptions, uh, I think something that everyone will agree on is that they are really cool and uh, everyone wants them. Not everyone, but a lot of people want to get those subscriptions to game um, services. Keep in mind, this is different from streaming. You can have a streaming in a subscription. Uh, you can have a subscription on a streaming service and vice versa, but not necessarily both together. A subscription can be uh, something that allows you to install games on your local machine to play them. Um, and they are good for consumers because they're a good deal. You get a lot of content. For publishers, uh, they get the insurance that the assurance to get your money every month instead of having to convince you to give them 60 bucks every few months, which is a, a more involved act. And I would argue even for developers, it gives them um, more ways to generate revenue, more revenue streams. Uh, they don't. They don't only. Uh, their option isn't only to sell you the game. They can, you know, provide it to some other services. So I think it it benefits everyone in the industry, and so it's definitely here to stay. Yeah, I, I mean, there's always an economic exception to the rule, right? Like I've of figured course. out the way to buy games and make it work the best and subscriptions are going to screw that up. Uh, but that's not most people. I think you point that out very well in your in your article. Most, most mm -hmm. people uh, have a, a more uh, predictable way of, of buying their games and, and subscriptions will probably save them some money, except if they forget to cancel the subscription, which is where it comes in to be making some money for the subscriber provider is they'll right. always have a little bit of that breakage. Yeah, it's either can or forgetting to cancel or just thinking just like you do with Netflix, well, there's enough good content that I'm not going to bother to cancel right. for a couple of months and then come back. Um, and of course, this is targeted as at uh, relatively hardcore gamers. When we say everyone, it's this uh, um, the, the uh, subsection of the core gamer community, which is still, you know, a lot of people. Right. Um, streaming is really interesting as well, because I think a lot of gamers, the, uh, again, those people think this is not going to be interesting for me, but they think of it in terms that are um, uh, what they can consider their habits right now. They're not thinking what streaming will enable for them in the future, such as something we talked about, trying out games that are in your subscription. You don't want to install, you know, if there are 20, um, that is a good thing. If you want to try a game from a competing service, it's easier to stream them. Um, Another thing is that is interesting with Google um, is the idea that they would be the white box um, service for 
all publishers to come in and they have a streaming service that lets you install games on PC. What about all the other devices? Well, just get your uh, subscription on Stadia and then everyone can use it on every device. And that is, I think, a compelling offer for those publishers to be available through, through uh, 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 subscriptions on every device. And from the industry standpoint, it makes a lot of sense because it breaks the monop the barrier of platform holders having to sell you the console for you to access the games uh, after that. Well, and it also makes it easier for you if if the things you want to play are going to be there to say, well, that's the thing I subscribe to then, rather than I'm going to have to pick an EA thing and a Blizzard thing and a, and a Microsoft thing, right? Like potentially- well, you could simplify your life a little bit. So that I, I think Google is going in a different direction. Um, it's not that Stadia is going to have its own subscription service that is going to include games from many different publishers. That might happen at some point. But I think what they're going to do, as they are already doing with Ubisoft, is say, Ubisoft, you have a subscription service. It's available on PC because, you know, not necessarily on other platforms. If you bring it to our service, people get a free tier at 1080p uh, streaming. And if they are subscribed to your service, they can use these games, all of the games from your uh, subscription on Stadia, the ones that you have ported over, uh, but they don't have to pay Stadia. They just pay the subscription they already pay. And Google gets a cut of the money that Ubisoft gets for the subscription. And I get, they yeah, might do no, that with. Point. It's less about I don't have to pay for multiple subscriptions and more about, oh, I've got one service that makes it easy to know I can play my games on all of these different devices. And it's Underline. even more interesting for the publisher because the publishers are not going to be able to ramp up the infrastructure to offer mm -hmm. streaming. Uh, it's much easier. It's the only option to go with, well, Google in the case of Stadia or maybe Microsoft or you know someone else if they are willing to do that. But in the case of Stadia, they're already willing to do it and they don't have a subscription themselves, at least so far. So it's easier to uh, approach. Yeah, kind of, kind of like Amazon Web Services for for websites, except for video games. So yeah, what's the pretty much about controllers. So well, the controllers. Some, oh, go ahead, Patrick. Uh, the controllers thing is, you know, I uh, Apple is bringing the the real controllers, PlayStation Four and uh, Xbox One, to its iOS devices, including Apple TV, which means. Uh, gamers can finally play games because the controllers are incredibly important. If you don't have good controls, you can't play those games, the traditional console games on your device. And since it's already possible on Android devices, it means every game uh, is going to be available everywhere through streaming in good conditions, of course, if you have a decent connection. That means that a PlayStation 4 um, owner, if they want to try a an Xbox game, they don't need to go out and buy an Xbox because every single device in their house is already going to be able to play that game. Halo 6 is probably going to be available on the uh, Microsoft streaming service. So you don't need to buy an Xbox, just press a button and you're playing. And in the mind of Sony, uh, the Sony person, um, as a company, what do you do when that's the case? Because Traditionally, you didn't need to worry about people jumping over because there was a large barrier to entry. Now that there isn't, is it worth it for them to have the Microsoft streaming service available on PlayStation? Um, which is people in tech might not understand how incredibly uh, um, uh, impossible that idea is, but for gamers, it's heresy. Uh, right. But the, the reasoning makes sense because if you are um, Sony, your customers are going to be able to play those games anyway. So would you rather let them play them on another platform or have them play play those games on your platform and get a cut of the money they're going to be giving Microsoft? It's a, a, a strange thought, but it might happen. I could see that happening. I really could. Uh, I think people, they they tend to personalize technology companies and think of them as, you know, people who don't like each other. And they're much more complex than that. And companies particularly are willing to do something that you might find unlikely if you're like, actually, we can make a lot of money doing that. Exactly. Which, uh, and Microsoft has been moving that way. Sarah, did you have something you wanted to add in? No, I just, I you know, the more we talk about this this model and and how models are evolving, the more I'm like, 
it just sounds like cable TV to me. Uh, it, I mean, <laughs> and I know that it's different, right? It, you know, we're, we're evolving, but it's sort of like, it's that kind of, it's all encompassing. You pay this thing per month and you get everything. And some people are like, that's what I want. But more and more often, especially because we're now used to kind of a la carte models, people are like, well, but... I want to pay less so, for just like five of those <laughs> games rather than 40 of but them. But th there are there are a lot of similarities, but there, there are uh, also key differences. Uh, you can decide which services you subscribe to. They're all a la carte. So you can get one if you want, and that's it. Uh, the other difference is you're not locked in. You can uh, very easily cancel the service from one month to the next. And if I can add the last difference, um, you get... A, 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 you have the other option, which is to buy an existing game, which is 60 bucks. 60 bucks will give you four to six months uh, worth of that service for that game you want to buy, plus a ton of other games. So it's not exactly the same dynamic as cable. Yeah. Well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit, completely free, a la carte. <laughs> Don't even need you. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Thanks to everybody who submits stories. You make our days brighter um, and you make our rundowns easier. Also, everybody in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Good times. All right, let's move on to Chris Christensen, the amateur traveler, who is back with a story about an airline's ad campaign telling potential passengers perhaps not to fly. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. One of the most unusual airline ads you might see is a recent ad from KLM, because KLM is asking you, do you really need to fly? In an effort to promote more responsible travel, especially because of CO2 production and global warming, they have a video ad which has come out that says, we need to ask you something to fly more responsibly. Do you always need to meet face-to-face? -face? Could you take a train instead? Could you contribute by compensating your CO2 emissions or packing light? It's an unusual campaign and a very unusual source. So kudos to KLM for giving us food for thought. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Um, in, fin in Sweden, actually, uh, there's a new concept that's uh, starting to become popular, which is um, plane shaming. People are uh, kind of shaming themselves and possibly others for taking the plane when they don't necessarily need to or just for taking the plane. It's a thing. Huh. Mm -hmm. Well. Huh. Very it responsible, those Swedes. Clever KLM Swedes and both of you. Well, yeah. KLM I know, like, like the cynic in me is like, what's this all about? <laughs> <laughs> what do you want, KLM? <laughs> uh, hey, we got an email here as well. Yeah, we do. From Rich Straffolino, our very own Mr. Anthropology, who wrote in about our conversation yesterday about the the idea of using cars uh, car rentals for something other than driving the cars rich says i think these short term car rental companies should be looking at people wanting to use their car rentals for sitting around as an opportunity partner with delivery services to have somebody with lunch waiting for you when you hop in for example maybe have the car already cooled down if you want to take a nap in there or pay more to access a clean pillow and blanket. Maybe have some cars rated for productivity with better noise insulation, dedicated hotspots, or phone chargers on hand. There's a lot of value adds to be had once you've figured out that this is a desired use case. We can call it Uber No. That means it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uber, Uber static. Uber ZZZ. <laughs> ah, nice. ZZZ, et cetera. Uh, thanks, Rich. Uh, you know, we work with you every day, but it's so nice to get your your feedback on on stuff that we talk about in the show. And also thanks to Patrick Beja. Patrick, where can people keep up with all your latest? Uh, well, if you want a, an expanded conversation on the topic we covered, um, we just recorded uh, last week, I believe, uh, the latest episode of MVGB with Scott Johnson, the monthly video game briefing, which uh, every month breaks down the most important stories in, in gaming and, and games for people who are not hardcore gamers, but still interested from afar. Uh, so there's that. And if you are a hardcore gamer, Pixels is my gaming show in English that you might be interested in. It's available in your podcast app and it's called Pixels.
Folks, uh, if you're worried about e-waste, uh, we have a good show for you. I talked to a professor uh, from Canada about e-waste, and he pointed out that, A, when we focus on the end product, what goes in the landfill, we may, in fact, we are not getting the whole picture on how to prevent e-waste. Uh, and the things that you think may be the problems with e-waste are not the biggest problems anymore. You got to check this out. Uh, it's in the Patreon feed right now at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you have burning questions or something you want to get off your chest, guess what? We've got an email address, and that email address is feedback at dailytechnewshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday. Join us if you can, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>